miss all of your teenage life. I would like you to have some kind of an adult life. That's all I'm saying. Dad, I don't You know what I did? I killed my I know you did. You know what I think about that every day? What? Me taking my... So he was reaching for something? Yeah. I thought he was reaching for a gun. So I'm like, oh shit, you know what I'm saying? That's what he's doing. It's gonna mark me or break me or something. Yeah. And then what did you do? I shot him. And it's like all these thoughts all of a sudden rushed in my head. What have I done? What am I doing? What did just happen? You know what I'm saying? Did I just kill him? Is he okay? Is he all right? Did the gun hit him? If he hit him, I'm saying, if he heard it, why is he moving? All this and that other I'm saying, what's that noise he's making? Because I heard the blood pour. It was like water pouring on the ground. And I was thinking, oh, the blood's going to come from under the bed. That was a big thought. I kept thinking that and touched me. Centoya is a complex child. She is the little girl that everyone would love to have. This is a kid um, who had some horrible life experiences. Many, many bad things happened to her, and it wasn't just an isolated bad thing, but it was it was a pattern of bad things, and that this shaped. Um, the way she related to people. She would step out of bad situations and then she would find herself another bad situation to get into. She allowed herself to get involved with one more bad situation. All right. We are here this afternoon, I believe, in the matter of Sequoia Brown. And it's my understanding this is set as a transfer hearing, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Yes, ma'am. So are we ready to proceed? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. You are Centoya Brown. Yes, ma'am. I have your date of birth listed as January the 29th, 1988. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That makes you, what, 15? 16. 16. 16, yeah. Do you understand why you're here? Yes, ma'am. All right. This is not a hearing to determine if you're guilty or innocent of the charges against you. The only purpose of today's hearing is to determine where your case should be tried, whether it should be heard here in the juvenile court. If she stays in juvenile court, she'll undoubtedly go to some sort of juvenile detention facility, um, but only until she's 19. If she were to be tried as an adult, she might get many, many years in prison. State your name, please. My name is Centoya Brown. The night of August 6th of 2004. Where did you begin that evening around, say, 7 o'clock? Um, I was in the hotel room. And what were you doing with Cut in the motel room at the in-town suites? We were either getting high or having sex. That's all we ever did. He said that I was slipping and that I was starting to become a slouch, that I needed to get out and get on my grind and get some money. When I left, I was looking for a ride so I can go out to East Nashville. Who were you going to see in East Nashville? Well, I wasn't going to see particularly anyone. I was going to an area that I knew was very, I don't know, it's, a lot of people go there and prostitute. Okay. Um, and how were you going to get there? I was going to get a ride from someone. When you walked up to the Sonic, who approached you? A man in a white truck. And is this the person that has been referred to throughout this hearing, Mr. Allen? Yes. Um, the question came up, was I up for any action? And the action, I guess you should know that it was insinuating sexual. He asked me how much, and I told him 200. And he said, no, 100. And we decided finally on 150. 
Who made the suggestion of going to his house? He did. I had actually suggested the hotel we was right there at, but he didn't want to go to the hotel. He said that he wanted to go to his house because there was no one there. Did he tell you who he lived with or anything like that? He said he lived by himself. That time he was just finished telling me about his accomplishments and saying how that he used to be in the Army and because I mentioned that I was from Fort Campbell. And so he related to how he was frosted in the Army before and that he was a sharpshooter in the Army. And then he had told me how a lot of women want him for his money and that he wanted someone to make love with him with desire. Did you see any guns in the house? Yes, I seen two shotguns downstairs, and he showed me a chrome gun with a black candle. Where were you when he showed you that? I was sitting at the table eating my food. You tend to be a nervous person. Yeah. Was there anything that made you especially nervous that night? Um, just how he was acting, just how he talked. It's like the way he talked, how he was just so important and stuff. And then me, I look at myself, who am I? Who am I to him? It's like, then he talks about the guns and stuff. If he does something to me, I'm sitting here thinking, what can I do? I'm in his house. Ain't nobody going to know where I'm at. My mom and them, they don't know where I'm at. The people that I stay with, chick on them, they don't know where I'm at. Nobody's going to know what happens to me. Cut, he doesn't care. He doesn't even know who I left with. And all this is just running through my mind, and I'm just a nervous wreck. Mr. Allen was asleep and facing away from you when you shot him. No, sir. All right. I, what I want you to do is to explain to the court then how it, you have you have a gun in your purse on the night, correct? Right. You don't want to do this. You don't want to be here. So you felt like if you tried to leave, he would harm you. <coughs> right. And your your belief in that is based on the fact that he told you he had some guns and he's a sharpshooter. Not only that, but uh, the way also, he's acting. Well, all I know about his activities is what you've told us, and that's really all we'll ever know, Miss Brown. Right. Since you killed him, the uh, the only thing we know is that you he took you to Sonic. He bought you food. He took you home. You used his bathroom. You felt comfortable doing that. You ate with him. You felt comfortable doing that. You sat on the couch and watched TV with him. You felt comfortable doing that. You got in the bed and at least one time went to sleep while he was there. You felt comfortable doing that. I never went to sleep. What what happened next? At first he was just stroking me, but then it's like he just grabbed me like in between my legs, like he just grabbed it real hard and he just gave me this look. It was like a very fierce look. And then it just sent these chills up my spine. I'm thinking he's gonna hit me or do something like that. But then he rolls over and reaches like he's reaching to the side of the bed or something, so I'm thinking, oh he's not gonna hit me, he's gonna get a gun. And what did you do at that time? I just grabbed the gun and I shot him. How did you become involved with the case of Centoya Brown? You contacted me and you asked me if I could do a pre-trial forensic psychiatric evaluation. Usually we do both uh, a psychiatric part, which is a psychiatric interview, and we also have psychological testing done. Let's start with adopted family. Yeah, my mom, Ellenette Brown. Yeah, my dad, Thomas Brown. What's her name? Ellenette? Mm-hmm. E-L-L-E-N-E-T-T-E. Okay. What yeah. kind of work does she do? She's a teacher. And then father is Thomas? Mm-hmm. What does he do? Is he a truck driver? He's a truck driver. And I know that you have two sisters in this family. No, I have a sister and a brother. Tell me about your, I guess your biological family. Who do you, what do you know about, who, who are they? Just, I just know Gina. Gina? Is this your biological mother? Yeah. Gina, as in Gina and Gina? Georgina Mitchell. Okay. But, um. How old is she, do you think? Oh, uh, she, I think she, she's probably 32. Yeah, do you know how to tell? Huh? Because she had me when she was about 16, I'm 16. Right. That's, that's right. Does that seem sort of funny to you that your mom was 16 and now you're 16? Does that... I guess. What's, I don't know. Does that seem sort of strange? No. I guess. Tell me about these people, your adoptive mom and dad. What are they like? Mom, she nags a lot. 
that she's a sweet person, but she wants me to be perfect and like her daughter. And my dad's asshole. That's the only word you need to describe it. Like, like, what do you mean? Like, what would he do? Like it, and like it. You know what I'm saying? Like it and stuff like that. He would, so, he would sort of swipe you, swipe you. Right? Sometimes he had no reason. Just he would actually say, "I swear for God," because I felt like it. I'm sorry. He said what? Because I felt like it when I asked him why he hit me. Oh, 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 oh! I see. That's what he would say. Yeah. What's this guy cut? What's his real name? Gary and McLean. So how long were you living with him? For like three weeks. And then what? So what was he like? Different hotels. I remember one time, the first time he did something to me is when he choked me and I passed out. Because he said I thought he was a joke. Mm -hmm. What else did he do to you? He talked real bad to me. And he jacked me up. He pulled me by my hair and dragged me and stuff. He put guns up to me. Do you ever have sex with the guys? When I cut put a fucking gun up to me, I did. Did he did, did he have sex with you too? Yeah, he had sex with me. Sometimes I don't want to have sex with him. He'd still fuck me. I'd be crying and everything. So how how come you stayed with him? You're not listening. I'm making him money. He wasn't going to let me go nowhere. He told me he'd kill me. He knows where my mom lives. And I know the dude choked me until I almost passed out. He's not afraid to kill me. Well, I'm going to talk to Kathy Evans. And, um, and then we're going to try to do something that might, might help you out when you go to court. Okay? Okay, thank you. I, you know, I said, well... Let's talk about, there are people that you, uh, there are times that you really, really like somebody, and then something happens, and then you don't like them. And she says, yeah, 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 that's me. That, that's what I do. That people will be nice to you, and then they'll be bad to you. I mean, that's the way people are. In other words, her perception of life is that everybody's like that. In other words, she doesn't see that she's the one who's, uh, casting people in these roles that she see, as far as she can tell, that's the way people are. Now, how did this manifest itself when the, this guy uh, Johnny was killed? See, I think that some of these characteristics affected the behavior, specifically um, her affective instability. In other words, uh, becoming uh, suddenly frightened about the situation she was in. Um, and her paranoia, which is part of this condition. Um, so I think it's possible to say that the criminal act was related to her personality disorder. Were you able to establish a rapport, and were you able to get additional information from Centoya? Well, yes, I had a good meeting with her. We, we met for two hours, and she talked a great deal about her life and about the offense. Her biological mother side of the family is extremely heavily loaded with psychiatric disorders. Um, bipolar, personality disorder, suicidal, manic depressive, which is in guarded condition. Um, at times I've had homicidal thoughts uh, for people that have hurt me. Um, for I've been raped, and I've always, you know, wanted to do things to them for hurting me. And Let me ask you this. You actually attempted suicide in the past? Yes, ma'am. What does this tattoo on your arm say? Suicide. And Dr. Burnett will address, but is there a history of suicide throughout your family, actual suicides? Yeah, my mom shot herself in front of me when I was in second grade. Um, her sister, uh, which is my aunt, just killed herself with a shotgun. Um, my grandpa, he shot himself in the head. Um, my Aunt Shirley, she's tried to kill herself God knows how many times. So that's the half having to do with genetics. The half having to do with uh, early development is, I guess, is interesting in the, in the sense that 
you know, the, the basic theory is that people have trouble during achieving these first two stages of life, and that's ages zero to uh, three or four. And that's exactly the point in Centoya's life that was uh, just totally messed up. First of all, she lived with a number of different people. Uh, I mean, I was trying to keep track of the, the different caretakers, but I mean, there were six or seven different people uh, who took care of Centoya. And this meant comings and goings and separations. And at one point, she was kidnapped by a family member. And, and 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 she felt like she had been abandoned by her by the other mother. I mean, this is exactly the kinds of problems that would create a failure to achieve the the attachment and then the healthy separation. We started to see really really bizarre behaviors as far as um, very manipulative. Um, controlling the situation. You know, a very possessive. How is she possessive? What types of things? Well, I can only speak, but like, she was very possessive when it came to her and I as far as our relationship goes, you know. Whenever she thought that I was getting too close to someone or someone was getting too close to me, then she would act out. I mean, you know, pouting stubborn behavior, jealousy, you know, that sort of thing. I think that's exactly what happened here, is that she was born with a vulnerability, and then during this critical period up to age three, she ends up with all these wrong separation experiences, and she ends up with this personality disorder. I'm not actually sure e even how this happened. I, I'm under the impression that it was a kind of an informal arrangement by which uh, the mother let the Browns raise Centoya. But we, we need to find out kind of how that happened. Today, we're going to have an opportunity to talk to her adoptive mother, with whom she uh, lived since about age two, and also with her biological mother. It's a little bit unusual to be able to talk to her biological mother because she really has been out of the picture now for many years in Centoya's life. Interesting. Ms. Mitchell, I'll, I'll tell you what I would find helpful just to kind of get up to date is, is how things went yesterday when you saw Centoya. How'd that go? I was just so glad to see her, um, you know, for the first time since she was little. And, I mean, she's very beautiful. And she just reminds me so much of me when I was that age. Oh, brother? Really? Yeah. Like what? Can you give us an example? Uh, uh, twin. <laughs> um, the, the ups and downs, uh, anger one minute, happy the next. You know, she wanted to know about um, our side of the family and, you know, how I was doing and how, you know, the way I used to be, how I changed my life around, how I rehabilitated myself. When I met Centoya's mother, uh, Georgina, she was pregnant with uh, Centoya. Uh, of course, at the time, I didn't know that because all of the kids wore the big jerseys, you know, with the numbers on them, my daughter included, my older daughter included. She came to my house like most teenagers did uh, during the time. My house was the house where all the teenagers hung out. My son said to me, Mom, uh, can we go to see Gina at the hospital? And of course, my first reaction was, why? What's wrong with her? And uh, my son said, well, mom, she had a baby. I said, she had a baby? He said, yes, ma'am. I said, well, is, is it yours? He said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. She was pregnant when we met her. It really didn't sink in that I was really pregnant, you know, until my stomach got big. But, you know, I psyched my mind out, you know, this is not true. You know, it couldn't be real. I didn't understand it until the baby came.
When I got pregnant, I was I was drinking, um, and even after my pregnancy, I still drank on a daily basis. Having a newborn and I was a child myself, I couldn't handle it, so I would escape to the bottle. I drank for about eight months of her life, and uh, the eighth month, that's when I was introduced to crack cocaine. And so when I got introduced to crack cocaine, I also got introduced to the easy money on how to get it, which was prostituting. So during this time when I was, when I started smoking, I liked that I could escape all my problems, all my responsibilities, because I didn't even know the responsibility of taking care of a child. You know, I, I couldn't keep putting her a child into that type of lifestyle that I was in because I never knew where I was. Um, she came to my son and asked my son, uh, Chico, if he would take the child because she was in trouble. And um, at the time, I didn't know what kind of trouble, but we soon found out later. And of course, she you know, was in serious trouble. She had gone to jail, and it was just several incidents after that with the police. So we took her um, the first time, I think she was six months old, and had her until um, she was um, 18 months. They had always told me, mommy had always told me how Gina never tried to get in contact with me and that she didn't want me. And it used to hurt my feelings because I used to wonder why would she not want me and why would she not try to write me and stuff. And I found a whole lot of letters, like 20 letters from Gina from when she wrote me when I was a baby. And it was all kind of pretty pictures drawn on the envelopes and stuff. And it was written from jail. And uh, it just made me mad because they should have given that to me as soon as I was able to read, you know? But they didn't. And uh, she was telling me how she loved me and stuff. to see my mom. If I don't say too much around here, it's best. Because if she gets started, it's just going to send me into a whirlwind. I'm going to go berserk. I already know it. She knows how to push my buttons. She knows which ones to touch. And it doesn't take very long, because we usually can't stay around each other no more than five or ten minutes. Sometimes it's better to adopt the child than it is to keep it. Well, what about in this case? I can't say, Gina, because you were so young. You were so young. You, I'm saying look at then and now. Did, okay, was adoption the right thing for her, do you think? The way her life ended up? Adoption yeah, must we have can't, been... It we can't blame that on adoption. Oh, my God. I don't think that. Unless he knows more than I do, and they're thinking. What about that, unwilling adoption? I didn't want to adopt her out. Oh, unwilling adoption? Yeah. It was done against my will. How were you going to feed this child? How were you going to take care of this child? That's why they did, have systems I for. I did see you try. Now, she did have an apartment, and had just gotten it, I think, and was going to beauty school. And, and working. And working. But sometimes the load gets too heavy and some people aren't strong enough to get it. Yeah, it had to be heavy on a 17-year-old with a baby going exactly. to school and working. That's, that's the point right there. That's the point. All I wanted was somebody to help me, show me something. I, Linda had to show me how to make a bottle. I didn't even know how to make a bottle. That's why children should not have children. That's exactly why they should not have children. That's why and, parents and, and, intervene. But, this, but I don't think because you couldn't make a bottle, that's why I told you, has turned out such as she has. That's a start right there. If you can't feed them, how the hell can you raise them? I think Centoria was abused as a child, and she was physically abused, and it, it sounds like she was 
uh, sexually abused over, over a period of time. Sexual abuse is a really, really big problem. In a way, our society has gotten much, much better at identifying these children. Now, unfortunately, we, we don't always, and I think Centoya's case, um, her sexual abuse went on unrecognized for, for, I guess, considerable period of time. And it does affect a person later. I can't move now. What do you mean in these? They right there like this. The other one's on the side. Go get the other ones with handcuffs on the side. I can move. Did you hear me? Huh? Stand up. Winston's got them on the ground who went to court. There's more than one, so I know you lying. They're all like this. No, they're not. The other four No, they're not. This. How was that when me, Crystal, and Miss Carolyn had one last time we went to court? I'll check it. Four, twenty-five, twenty-six memories. I mean, it's just a whole lot of memories. Are they good memories or bad memories or just memories in general? Uh, mostly bad. Oh, and this is my sex list. And you know what that means, don't you? Sex list? People you had sex with? Yeah. That person while I was asleep, I woke up and he was fucking me in my ass. Him, he tricked me into it. He was his best friend. And he got me. I just watched the pornos and seen when men came up to God and started taking out the girl's clothes. The girl just lays there and does whatever and screams and all that stuff. And that's what I figured was supposed to happen. So anybody, anytime somebody wanted to have sex with me, I just, I just did it. I felt like obligated, like that was what I was supposed to do. You know what I mean? I had sex with 21 people out of the 36 where I felt that I just had to do it. It was what I was supposed to do. And 22 people out of the 36 people were hardly or not known. And 28 people are connected with a bad experience. And Esau raped you at that point? Well, he didn't sit there fucking with the gun on my head, but it's like when I tried to leave, that's when he pulled the gun out. And I started to walk off, he just grabbed me by my arm, and he had a gun in his hand. He's like, nah, you're not leaving. And he pushed the gun and pulled it up or whatever. And he said, take these off. And then did it like that on my shirt. So I took my clothes off. I just got on the bed and I just lay there. I just cried. You know, where was I when all of this was happening? Where was I? I mean, could you not come to me and talk to let me know how you was feeling? And it's just, I don't know. I'm thinking at that age, I don't, I won't say most children, or even all children, but Centoya, um, I don't think she was very trusting of me. Maybe she thought that anything she confided to me about, that it wouldn't be just to me. Maybe she thought that I would share that with someone else. I, I don't know, because we have a good relationship. I, I don't understand why she felt that she couldn't come to me and talk to me, no matter what it was. Even if I tried to tell her, she wouldn't listen. She'd probably just tell me, okay, okay, sweetie, go, go play. That's what she used to always say. No parent wants to think that their, their young daughter, you know, is uh, experiencing sex, you know, especially at such a young age. And then to find out that there's been many, you know, several boys and men. But it does not change how I feel. That is my daughter. She's always going to be my daughter. No matter what she does or have done, that isn't going to change how I feel about her. I didn't want people to know I was dumb so I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything about this that Miss Kathy says could help me because I didn't want people to know how dumb I was and all the dumb stuff I did. 
Especially this. This is dumb for some girl that has sex with 36 people. Okay. 11 of those people, it was not statutory rape. There were three people out of 36 people that were relatives. There are four people out of 36 people that I actually liked or lusted for. There are nine people out of 36 people that it was protected sex. There was five people out of 36 people that were girls, and there was four people out of 36 people that were prostitutes. Lots of girls experience some degree of sexual abuse, and it's estimated like uh, 30, 35 percent have some un sexual abuse in the broad sense of some unwanted sexual activity uh, or exposure to sexual activity as a child. Part of what happens is that the more severe the abuse, the more likely it is to have psychological effects later in life. Depression, suicidality, uh, anxiety problems, substance abuse problems, um, in some cases, behavior problems. I was, I was very well put together. I, mean, I got married when I was 19. I married David. He was a very poor provider. I would find myself cringing when he would come towards me with any sexual manner or, or any way like that. I mean, I would just cry. And I knew I had to get away. Tommy came to my house. I was doing dishes and he came up behind me. And I really wasn't expecting that by no means. Because I've never been around folks like that. And I'll, then he started slapping me. And this, he said, you're going you're gonna to get what you deserve. And he... He grabbed me and snatched me and started beating me and drug me to the bedroom. I, I got pregnant from that particular rape. How did I cope with it? I went from this to where I am now. But you know, you can use the word rape in many ways because I feel like all of us has been raped of our life when this incident happened to me. There's Tommy, there's Gina, and then there's Toria. The genetics are strong. And the genetics should stop. So what happened to your hair? You know, I cut my hair. Why'd you do that? Because I don't want to be pretty no more. Because it don't do nothing will cause you trouble. Think of what got me into this mess. Yeah, what guy? Kind of Being attractive. And what do you attract? Crazy people. So, what do you see as similarities between all the different men who have been in your life, besides the fact that they're men? How are they similar? How are they different? Selfish. That's what they're similar. They're all selfish. They do whatever to get what they want makes them happy. They don't think about others' happiness. And everything that they do, they feel they're justified. They don't ever accept fault. That's what my dad said. He said uh, in his letter, he goes home and sleeps at night knowing that he did his best. Bullshit. What did Johnny want from you? Sex. For money. No. They all wanted acceptance and admiration. Hell yeah, that's what they wanted. My dad wanted to be admired because of the hard work he put in driving trucks and making that money and supplying us with the life that we lived. Mm, cutthroat, he wanted to be admired by everyone else in the street because I remember that one time he said that we, I was gonna work and get him this truck. It was a Suburban on some 26s. He wanted admiration, he wanted somebody to respect him, he wanted people to admire him. That's, oh my God, fuck. And then, you got Johnny, what did he say? I want a woman to make love with me with desire. Remember I told you that part? Desire. He wants to be accepted. Hell yeah. And those are my fucking problems. 
How are they your fucking problems? Because I always want to be accepted. For 18 fucking years. thing about when you make a statement that they read you your rights and stuff like that? I know that when they arrest you, I've seen it on cops. Right. And they did it to me. But I didn't, I didn't know it meant that you can be quiet. Right. Well, that's what you we're... have the right to remain silent, anything you say is going to be held against you. Well, All that, that um... that's what we're going to talk about right now. Uh, give me your first name. C-Y-N. C-Y-N-T-O-R-I. After I read each sentence to you, I will read three other sentences that mean the same thing or not the same thing as the sentence you'll be seeing at the top of the page. So the sentence at the top says, you do not have to make a statement and have the right to remain silent. Well, the first one says, you should not say anything until the police ask you questions. Does that mean something? Same. If you won't talk to the police, then that will be used against you in court. Same. If you tell the police anything, it can be repeated in court. Same. This is, I have read the statement of my right. I have the right read to me, and I understand what my rights are. I am willing to make a statement and answer questions. I do not want a lawyer at this time. Tell me how this, how all these questions I was asking you, how do they fit into your situation? They, I don't know. See, right now I see it and I understand them. But then I didn't understand. I was high and I was tired. So what kind of everything. deal did they give you? They didn't give me none. But what did they say about the deal? They just said that they gave me a deal. They promised that they can give me a deal. And when we was reading the rights, it said no promises have been made. And I said, yes, promises was made. And uh, it's on the tape that I said that. What kind of promises did they give you? He promised me that he was going to give me a deal. But, but, but when he, what was he talking about? What kind of deal? What kind about of time. Well, sure we, we, we will do everything we can to help you. If we can, you know. Then we do to help you, we will. Well, what does that mean when he says, I'll talk to the DA? I don't know. I talk to him. I well, he, talk to he him. He might about talk you. to him every day about the weather or about the football game. But yeah, but he meant that he talked to him about giving me a deal. But, but what, what would the deal be? What kind of deal? Like less time to serve. Because if I didn't, he said nine times out of ten I was going to do life. So did he say? And they screwed me because I might be doing life anyways. Did he say that? Um, did he actually say that, that mm -hmm. he would get you less time? Mm -hmm. He actually used that word? No, he said, uh, I can promise that we can get you a lighter, lighter sentence. I think they need to look at, she's a, she's a real person, she's a, and she's a kid. She's, a, she's a, a kid who, who is basically adrift, and she ends up in a bad situation. And that's really different, to, in my mind, than a person who's committing first-degree premeditated murder. First-degree murder, for an adult, you can get the death penalty. Now, she's not eligible for that because she was a minor when this happened. But when, when you think of first-degree murder as a really serious event, First-degree murder is what our society feels the, re the response should be the death penalty, should be life in prison. And in my mind, it doesn't fit um, an action by a 15-year-old in a bad situation, in a bad, impossible, 
gruesome situation. It, it, to me, what our society means by first-degree murder is not what happened that night. comes to the charge of first degree murder, we the jury find Santoya Brown guilty. When it comes to the charge of felony murder, we the jury find Santoya Brown guilty. When it comes to the charge of a special aggravated robbery, we the jury find Santoya Brown guilty. Those are the words I fear most more than anything else in life. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then we need to add probably self-defense in the jury instruction. So okay. some, some that's going to come out. This defendant shot Johnny Allen in the head, in his bed, in his home, 27 to 28 miles still drive. When you walked in the door, the closest item to the door were this silk underwear and these socks on the floor, right? I believe so. They weren't hidden? No. Likewise, this is a 4B, again, the hardwood floor, and the shirt. Yes. It was after him getting into the bed, this 43-year-old man, naked, touching her, she's moving away, that she said she reached for the weapon and fired one time. Yes. Medical examiner's opinion was he was in this position when he was shot. And that was a challenge. I killed a man, which is not sufficiently descriptive. I executed him. You spoke with Santoya numerous times in the last two years since she's been in jail, right? Yes, I have. And you visited her just about every weekend, correct? Yes. And when you visited her, you have spoken with her about her situation? Yes. And every single time when you visited that you talked about her situation, Santoya told you that she shot Mr. Allen because she was fearful of him, didn't she? Yes. So when you had this phone conversation that the jury's hold, heard the whole call, to put it in context, and she said the words, I killed a man, I executed him, Mommy, did you think that was some sudden change of her confessing to you what happened? No. Um, Santoya has a way of taking things out of context. Um, you know, she may say one thing but actually mean something different, and uh, she does it a lot. But the conversation was that not so much as her trying to confess to me, she was at a point in her life that she was feeling very helpless. Um, she was, in essence, trying to tell me to go on with my life. Don't waste my life, you know, trying to uh, wait for her. She felt that she had embarrassed uh, herself, but mainly she had embarrassed me. At that point, I mean, I could tell because I'm her mother. <clears throat> All she wanted was in saying, I know what my outcome is. So you go on, and you do what you have to do. Don't waste it on me. And I guess she did find herself trapped in this way. She found herself trapped between what she knew, the detectives knew and could easily prove, and her need to her dire need to make up a story about this. She knew she was had. What else can she say? What else can she say? She's taken care of the one person who could really counter this preposterous and ridiculous self-defense self on She knows he can't say anything. Because this is what she did to him. You and your partner are using all the experience and training that you have, using every technique you've been taught to get a statement from her, correct? That's correct. 
And in the very beginning of that entire process, your partner and you said, all we want is the truth. That's correct. And you said, if you tell me the truth, then we're going to go to the district attorney's office. Right? That's right. Because you had to make certain that Ms. Brown understood that this was serious business. Yes. You were going to question her about a very serious situation. Right? Right. And you know from your training that you've got to start it out by saying you have the right to remain silent because if she says, I'm not going to talk to you, that's the end of it. Right. But she chose to talk to you. Correct. You and your partner. Yes. 22 years of police experience and a 16-year-old young lady. Right. Okay. Didn't you say to Ms. Brown, we will do everything we can to help you? Or is that the Page five, line one, right? Look at that. And, help her, and, and I explained to you what I meant by that is that we talk to the district attorney's office and tell them you cooperate. Johnny Allen was trolling Murfreesboro Road. That's what he was doing, and we all know it. And we know what he intended to do if she acts in self-defense from an honest even though mistaken conviction as to the extent of the danger, she will not be held criminally liable for her action. I'm not trying to tell you Santora Brown's an angel. We never have. We've told you from the beginning that she was a 16-year-old runaway doing the best she could. And on August the 6th, she thought she was going to have a night where she would be safe. But she was wrong. She exercised the only right that is available to anyone in that situation. As to these charges of murder, not guilty. As to this charge of especially aggravated robbery, not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. That was not her intent when she shot him, and you know it. And you know it. Thank you. And has the jury by the verdict in this case? Yes, sir, we have. Please stand and tell the court what they do. We, the jury, find the defendant, Centoya Denise Brown, count one, guilty first degree murder. Count two, guilty of felony murder. Count three, guilty of especially aggravated robbery. This is our verdict this 25th day of August. Thank you. You can have a seat. Hey, Mommy. Yeah, it's over with now. Well, I got life. Yep. Mommy, don't stress yourself out. I don't want you to have no stroke and a heart attack or nothing. Because that, that's the only thing that would get to me. You or Uncle Frank. And don't let it affect your job either. I love you too. Tell Uncle Frank I love him. And tell him we still have things that we could do. Yes, ma'am. Lo love you too. Okay. All right. Bye, Mommy. I love you too. I think I might cry when I go back up to my room. Yeah, when I start listening to the radio, then it's going to kick in. What can we do? What's the right thing to do when um, teenagers get in this kind of trouble? I don't think it's right. I don't think it makes sense just to throw them away. I don't think it makes sense to give a life sentence to a teenager who has committed a crime. To me, it, to me, it seems wasteful. It seems wasteful to take a life, you know, that's just starting and to say that it's, it's worth nothing, that nothing is ever going to come of it. To me, that's not the right thing to do. Yeah, it's hard to find young people like that. See you all I'll get my college today tonight. Well, we'll see you in the morning, young lady. See you in the morning. Don't be in no trouble. I'm not saying that we should just slap 
people on the wrist when they commit crimes like this. I, I think that, that we, we need to have a way to deal with it. But um, I think we should find a way that does not involve throwing away the next 51 years. It is depressing, but there are juveniles from whom society and this community has to be protected. Um, now, we all have our own opinions, I think, of where that line is drawn, where we stop trying to treat and rehabilitate this child and start imprisoning this child. Where's that line to be drawn? Um, sometimes it's a tough call. You have this little girl that's been in this adult life for a year or so, and now she's there permanently. Because whatever happens to her, she can't just say, well, you know, uh, mommy will take care of this, because mommy can't take care of that. She has to fend for herself. We all have choices, you know, and as an adult, you can pretty well think beyond what's happening right now. But with a child, you know, they're going to always think like a child, regardless. Regardless. I think the 15 and 16 year olds of the world are um, in this wonderful stage between childhood and adulthood. And uh, there are so many different things, there are so many different pathways through that stage. I think the more we, that we know about how genetic influences, environmental influence, and brain development all interact to create certain kinds of behavior, I think the more we know about that, the more we'll, we'll discover interventions and in what to do about them. There's not a day that goes by that I don't hate myself for the way that she's ended up. Like I said, it begins with me. It's ultimately my fault. From the beginning, it's my fault. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I feel sad because to think after all this time, um, Centoria feels that, you know, she can talk to me, she can be open with me. And the horrible realization that there's a possibility that outside of the glass and the barbed wire and the bars, that we may never actually be like a mother and a daughter should be. It breaks my heart to think that we've come this far and we may never, never have the type of contact that we so deserve to have. The biggest thing I learned about myself, the 10 months I was in solitary confinement, is that a rare and precious jewel was cast out to sea, and I must fight with everything in me to get it back where it can be held as one of the world's greatest treasures. I learned that my life was and is not over. It was these things that I thought about most on lockdown. As a young girl, I never knew the depth and strength of the power within me. And as a young woman, I know of my power and also of my ability to utilize it to gain success in whatever I pursue in life. As a fully grown woman, I suppose I get a clear understanding on exactly what that will be. 
For now, I'm content with fighting for my freedom and retaining sanity. As a young woman, I know I can do exactly that. Looking back, I can see that my childhood, from birth to adolescence, has great bearing on my perception. A lot of the time, I view people through the reflection of my past. I struggle today with abandonment and trust issues, as well as my attitude towards relationships with men. When I was younger, I always felt safe when mommy and I were alone together. I think growing up for me would have been different had I allowed my mom to be more active in my life. I never had any guidance because I never allowed her in. Secrecy was a code I crafted for my life. I regret that to this day. You never appreciate your parents' good sense and wisdom until you miss an opportunity where you needed it.